So let's start with a little bit of history, and we'll start with the origin of species, because arguably um, that book, uh, as is well known, should have been written as the origin of adaptations. Uh, Darwin had a keen sense of describing um, how competition breeds varieties, how artificial selection affects variation, uh, but he kind of left the problem of speciation to future biologists. Not entirely, but somewhat. And that's been reflected in this quote here, right? So why is not all nature in confusion instead of species being as we see them well-defined? We're going to talk a lot about speciation today and what structures species um, and how um, untraditional ways of thinking about speciation um, can be incorporated into standard models. So let's move from history to around the time of the modern synthesis. And I present genetics of the origin of species as something that we're all very much familiar with, written by Theodosius Dobzhansky, in which he starts to lay down the foundation for understanding speciation. Uh, Dobzhansky is credited, of course, with the biological species concept in part, um, as well as the dobzhansky muller model of hybrid incompatibilities. We all know this. What's not so well known is that 10 years prior to Dobzhansky's famous book, there was a guy named Ivan Wallen, who's a professor in Colorado, and he publishes a book called Symbionticism and the Origin of Species. And I'm struck by the uh, similar titles in these two books. It's almost like Dobzhansky, if you will, stole symbioticism, <laughs> replaced it with essentially nuclear genetics, right? And the foundation for evolutionary biology and genetics is established in 1937 with this book. And we don't know about Ivan Wall. Most of us don't. He's actually the mitochondria man, and you all should know him uh, because he postulated that mitochondria derived from bacteria uh, way before this was normally given credit to Lynn Margulis. Now, Lynn deserves her credit, but Ivan was the first, and he said, oh, these are divided by bacterial fission. Um, therefore, they must be bacteria, okay? or binary fission. Therefore, they must be bacteria. And if bacteria are present in the cells, um, he's, he starts to reason that these could be fundamental building blocks in evolution. Of course, that stuff dies, right? Why does it die? Well, Wallen claims that he cultures mitochondria from rabbit livers. And of course, this was scrutinized, it was never to be repeated, and it was all due to contamination. So Wallen dies in the history of biology, but yet he got to something incredible right, which is that mitochondria are, in fact, bacteria. And he also speculates, and I quote with some degree of specificity, that it's a rather uh, startling proposal that bacteria, the agents of infectious disease, may represent the fundamental causative factor in the origin of species. Will I go that far today? No, I won't. Okay. But, but, but it certainly is something to resurrect as we consider how important symbiosis is to speciation. This struggle uh, in, the, in these early 1900s is, is still pervasive in our community today. So these are two very prominent uh, evolutionary biologists, and I will quote them without putting their names up. I know very, very few cases in which endosymbionts cause speciation, and a ton of cases in which changes in host genes do, and in which those genes have been mapped. And I don't think we have any evidence yet that there has been speciation caused by microbes. I'm not willing to get that far yet. Wait, this wasn't 10 years ago. This is 2013, and we have people sort of saying this. And, 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 and we have lots of evidence that symbionts are involved in speciation, and I hope to present to you more today. I only present this kind of drama, if you will, just to sort of let's accept the fact that symbionts haven't been incredibly um, um, powerful in the speciation literature. We don't talk about them enough, and yet I think we should, and hopefully the work today will help us think a little bit harder about that. Let's talk about the reasons why there's some resistance to this. Right? So Coyne and Orr in 1997 published a very famous study in evolution um, in which they do some comparative studies in Drosophila, and they correlate the amount of gen genetic distance between Drosophila species relative to reproductive isolation on a scale of 0 to 1, where complete reproductive isolation is good species. And of course, this sets up the framework that clearly genetic distance and genetics, nuclear genetics, correlates with reproductive isolation. And then we have, I think, uh, some attitudes about the role of symbiosis around this time. Right? So symbionts are not specific to hosts, they're often transient passengers. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about this issue, and that 
actually, there is some accumulating evidence that there's species specificity in the microbial community, the general microbial community, not just one particular symbiont. Secondly, uh, symbionts are not abundant, and you know that's clearly outdated with the rise of molecular technology. We know that symbionts are universal in animals and plants. Uh, they're not genetically diverse. In the last few years, we've understood that the symbiont population can vastly outnumber the genetic diversity of the nuclear genome. And I'll present to you a little bit of uh, data on that from humans. And then finally, symbionts aren't important to host fitness, uh, basically at a wide taxonomic range, and that's clearly not true. All right. So part of the reason why we know some of these things to not be true is um, from some studies that have gone on in model systems, but also in the human microbiome. And the Human Microbiome Project got started in about 2007. And you'll notice that on this Google search engine, it sort of indicates total web interest from the populace and scientists with a scale of 0 to 100, where 100 is the most um, searched time for the term microbiome. That we've undergone this sort of exponential growth in people looking for the microbiome. So it's trendy. It's become popular in search trends to, to understand what the microbiome actually is. And that's in part had an effect on how I think the, the biological community is looking at microbial stuff symbionts in regards to animal biology and plant biology. So from the Human Microbiome Project, we have learned a few things. Um, so this is just a cartoon showing that in different communities of the human body, there are different types of microbial species, and that the human body is essentially its own geographic landscape. And there are different communities of microbes on the skin versus the genital tract versus the intestines uh, versus the respiratory system, right? So wherever you look, there's sort of a, a special community. And if you total up the sort of number of unique genes in the microbiome, we're talking about 8 million genes derived from the bacterial microbiome of a human compared to the 20,000 genes that exist in the nuclear genome. So when we're talking about genetic diversity, profoundly affected uh, at a hundredfold higher grade or diversity in the microbiome versus the nucleus. And one of the things we have to confront now is how much of this, if a fraction of it, maybe not all, but how much of that together forms a hologenome, that is the genome of the nucleus plus the microbiome forms perhaps the unit of selection, which we could call the hologenome. And do we need to fundamentally consider that as a persistent entity, that the microbiome is persistent over evolutionary time, and that we need to incorporate it into our models of, of what we think of as the unit of selection? Um, think of it in terms of all those studies that have tried to look at heritability of certain traits. And heritabilities are often not, not too high. What else could be explaining those heritabilities? It could be that the microbiome, as well as other environmental factors, are part of those missing heritabilities of traits. For the most part, microbiome stuff is focused on within lifespans. So health and disease has become a big deal, right? IBD, um, respiratory diseases, and even birthing routes affect the microbial communities by which children inherit. And we know that when these things go awry, there are problems with, with the human fitness, if you will. This is all within lifespan stuff. And what I'm interested in is sort of across generations, what is the persistence of the microbiome, it doesn't matter to evolutionary biology in a significant way. And I'm not the only one thinking that. Many people have proposed terms. So superorganism is one term that comes with some controversy in the ecology field. Uh, Metaorganisms is, is another term that Margaret McCall and the guy is promoting, all of which emphasizes that the animal and plant, uh, uh, these things live in a bacterial world and they need bacteria. And that germ-free animals and plants can never be released into the wild and survive. So there's something essential, but we don't know exactly what that is yet. And we need a framework for it. Much of the uh, microbiome stuff is sort of dietary related. You see lots of headlines like this. So you are what you eat. And I think one persistent question as we think about this is, is the microbiome part of the environment? Or is it part of the essentiality of the, of the whole of genome? And we don't know the answer to this, right? This is sort of, I think, a frontier that we have to confront. And it may be that it's simply environmental and we don't have to worry about it. But if it's not, what is the whole genome and how can we start to characterize it? Again, from humans. Um, so on the left here is just a sample of individuals from the Human Microbiome Project. 
And this just shows from, at a phylum level the types of bacteria shown here that can populate a human. And this is the gut microbiome. And there's some amount of diversity, but for the most part, it's populated by these bacteroides in blue and the firmicutes in green. But even more profound is that if you look at the metagenomic signature of these microbial communities, so you just shotgun sequence them, what's stable in all these individuals is the functional profiles of the microbial community. So even though there's variation in OTUs, there's actually pretty consistent function going on. And so we see this over and over. And our, our organisms, in fact, selected to acquire microbes that do certain functional things that complement missing functions that we can't do in our own genome. So the history of the hologenome is, you know, it's sort of mixed up in many different people thinking about this from meta-organism to just people who work on symbiosis in general, I think, think about this. If you want sort of the history of the terms, we've got two independent origins. In 1994, Richard Jefferson, who's no longer in academia, is kind of a social entrepreneur. Uh, you can find a talk on YouTube and some blogs by him that talk about this hologenome idea. He worked on plants and endophytes. And then independently, the Rosenbergs published this theory in 2008 and have done some nice work in Drosophila on it as well. So can we take that cartoon of the hologenome and start to structure it in ways that make sense to us? So let's just take this very simple model of the last common ancestor start to diversify both in genetic makeup from the nuclear genes and the microbiome. And we have the onset of reproductive isolation and then speciation is complete here. And when speciation is complete, we know that these things can't mate. And what I'm interested in is when hybrids die or become <laughs> sterile. And that's my only joke. So <laughs> I would appreciate a laugh. All right. I'm not very funny, so that's it. Um, so, okay, so if this is a, a model that we can actually work with, what would it look like? And there are lots of confounding variables here. If you look at organisms with different diets, they're going to have different microbiomes. So a vegan diet, you know, in a human has a different microbiome than a Western diet. So what I want to do is start to pick away at these variables and say, what if we control for all the environmental factors, especially diet, what would the hologenome look like if it is real? And one aspect may be that if diet's controlled for, then every organism carries the same amount of microbes, carries the same types of amount of microbes. There's no variation. Environment's controlled, everybody's got the same gut bacteria, for example. However, it could be also that there's a species specificity in which we see microbial community changes correlating with genetic divergence. So over time, there is this positive relationship. And what that could lead to is a predictive framework where we have parallel phylogenetic representations of the host genome relative to the microbial community. I want to emphasize that this is not your standard sort of co-speciation um, symbiont gene sort of phylogeny analysis. What, this is a little different here because what we're asking are the communities more related between these two host species than they are between these. Right? It's a community relationship. So along this microbial, microbial divergence axis, it's not changes in gene sequences per se, but changes in the types and abundance of microbes. So it's a kind of a community cluster analysis. And in, in the microbiome field, we call these unifrac trees, so it'll come up uh, in my talk. Okay. So can we correlate community changes in the microbiome with, community, with the host genetic divergence? Starting with the hypothesis that the environment's controlled for. So if there's species specificity and the immune system is specifically looking for specific microbes, Perhaps we'll see patterns like this. So we think of the, uh, the, this field in terms of two types of models, a narrow sense and a broad sense. And under the narrow sense model, we think of microbes driving reproductive isolation completely on their own. Um, and then in the broad sense, we think about microbes interacting with the genome, as I was just showing you in the slide before, driving reproductive isolation and sort of this hologenomic view, if you will. We've addressed both these questions with the model system Nisonia, which is a parasitoid wasp. Um, this is a male kind of grooming himself, this is a female grooming herself, and you'll see them contact and mate and, and do the romance. Thing. While you're doing that, I hope to take your eyes off of some things, which is um, there are three species of Nisonia that we work with in the lab, Nisonia vitropenis, 
Nasonia longicornis and Nasonia duralti, which will be referred to as VLG for the most part. All right, stay stay with me here. So, um, <laughs> longicornis and duralti are young species. They diverged very recently, 400,000 years ago, and then their ancestor diverged from Vitropenis about a million years ago. We call that the old species. Here's the geographic distribution. So longicornis is on the west coast, duralti is on the east coast, and Vitropenis is cosmopolitan. Um, it exists throughout and sympatrically with these other species. Okay, excellent genetic resources, etc. We don't have to get into that right now. The final romance, and we'll keep going. So the next thing in the So any system that I have to make you familiar with is it's a two-party system and uh, these are flesh flies and so Nasonia <coughs> parasitized flesh flies as parasitoid wasps and we raise flesh flies like this we take a, a meat company delivers us liver it's a, it's a really pretty process we take these larvae or, or eggs or they become larvae they start to feed on that they become big maggots and those maggots develop into pupae and that's the stage in which Nasonia parasitized uh, the fly. So then comes along our mother who's fertilized or unfertilized and she starts to uh, lay her own eggs beneath this puparium covering onto the skin of the developing fly. After that we get larvae, uh, pupae, and adults. Their generation time is two weeks. This is the Drosophila of the haplodiploid world. Very easy to work with, very quick to work with, lots of offspring and so forth. The final thing I want to about is that Nasonia actually has even more stuff going on in it. So inside Nasonia are Wolbachian bacterial symbionts, and these are vertically transmitted symbionts. So here's an egg of, of Nasonia. It's um, labeled in blue for DNA. This is just the dividing chromatin of the, of the egg or embryo. And then this is in St. Green is the Wolbachian end of symbionts that have been deposited from the mother's ovaries right into the developing oocytes and then this egg is now populated with Wolbachia symbionts. Okay. This is an electron microscope picture of Wolbachia. It's about one micron in size. Um, there are tiny bacteriophage particles populating this Wolbachia cell, <laughs> shown blown up in here. Um, I'm not going to talk to you about the phage stuff, but it's another arm of our, our laboratory. But I will talk to you about Wolbachia, because this is very relevant to the narrow sense model of, of microbes assisting speciation. So we take the species hybridizations. In this case, it's an older species pair, Geraltai and Vitropenis, that diverged a million years ago. These younger species diverged 400,000 years ago. Now, Wolbachia infect the germline. They infect the testes, which are shown here, accessory glands of the male. They also infect the ovaries. And it turns out that if we do crosses between the species with Wolbachia infections, hybrid production goes way down in both crosses. And then if we antibiotically eliminate the Wolbachia and let these hosts maintain themselves Wolbachia free and then bring them together and do the same crosses, we see an increase, a dramatic increase in hybrid production um, in the absence of Wolbachia, right? So this is all old stuff, but it shows us that Wolbachia alone in a narrow sense can drive extreme and significant hybrid mortality, where the microbe is in a sense the primal cause of the reproductive isolation. Well, it turns out Wolbachia um, caused this phenomenon called cytoplasmic incompatibility, sort of an analog to cytoplasmic male sterility in plants. And what we 
have here is an infected male crossed to an uninfected female, and no offspring are produced. And then the reciprocal cross yields compatible number of offspring, and they're all Wolbachia infected because Wolbachia is maternally transmitted. Right? So this is an embryo of Wolbachia, again, showing the Wolbachia in the egg that's been maternally transmitted. And then this is the testes showing the Wolbachia populating the testes in, red, uh, in green. The cell crosses are compact. So Wolbachia causes CI because it's a maternally transmitted infection. So in this hypothetical population, 50% of individuals are infected with Wolbachia, right? No, no brain dead. But in the next generation, the proportion of Wolbachia is what? It's going to be two-thirds because the fitness of uninfected females is reduced by the male bearing this incompatible sperm with the female's uninfected egg. So we go from 50% to two-thirds. Every generation, this ratchets itself forward, and you have Wolbachia fixing through the population. Um, there are some mitotic defects for why uh, the Wolbachia caused this modification. Um, so this is just the paternal and maternal genome in the first mitotic division of the egg. And then uh, upon uh, pro-metaphase, we start to see changes in the paternal genome where it's not condensing. In metaphase, the paternal genome remains uncondensed. And in telophase, at that division, we have this sort of telomeric bridge of paternal DNA that's being shredded. Um, and this causes aneuploidy and death of that particular embryo. So that's what's going on here uh, on, on the incompatibility. Uh, it can also happen in a reciprocal cross direction. So in this case, we just take Wolbachia, uh, different strains of Wolbachia in males and females, and reciprocally they're incompatible. You can see that this would lead to an obvious narrow sense model of speciation because it's just the microbes that are preventing gene flow between these hypothetical populations. And that's what in Nisonia. Um, and you can imagine something like this, where you have a population uninfected with Wolbachia, and then they split geographically. Two populations acquire different infections. Those spread to uh, fixation by unidirectional CI. And then once they come back into contact, we have uh, reciprocal CI uh, maintaining the species barriers. So what effect does this have on the genetics of speciation? Because traditionally we think of, you know, as we showed in the coin and ore chart, genetic divergence correlating with reproductive isolation. And what symbionts can potentially do is lead to a very rapid uh, evolution of reproductive isolation. So instead of this gradual curve that we tend to think of as how the evolution of reproductive isolation might occur, if Wolbachia comes in at a young stage, and pushes the speciation event to completion, it enhances the rate at which speciation might product, progress by genes alone. So we see that actually in Nisonia. If you start looking at other reproductive isolation traits, the older species pair has a significant amount of F2 hybrid mortality, as shown here. The younger species pair doesn't. And that's important because they don't start, they don't actually show a lot of reproductive isolation. In fact, if you just put it in sort of this chart of what level of reproductive isolation exists in the younger species pair, very little exists outside of Wolbachia. Just a little bit of mate discrimination and a whole lot of CI are the essentially earliest evolving reproductive barriers in these two species that could assist the speciation process. Whereas the older species pair, as we expect, has significant more amount of reproductive isolation and types. Okay, there are many paths to this. So John Janicki's lab at the University of Rochester has shown that mushroom feeding Drosophila um, can experience levels of cytoplasmic incompatibility in hybrid zones. So this is Drosophila resins from the northeast. It meets Drosophila subquinaria. And at that hybrid zone, the resins population is infected with Wolbachia and causes cytoplasmic incompatibility against subquinaria females. In subquinaria females, actually can just mate discriminate against recent males. So there's this conjunction of sort of nuclear-based mate discrimination with Wolbachia unidirectional CI to start to initiate the species <laughs> process. Yeah. And there are many other examples in, in, in insects where Wolbachia could be playing a role in speciation. I want to get to the broader sense model because that's our, our latest stuff, but that historical context is relevant to you know, what we think about speciation by symbiosis in general in this field. 
So Wallen was very much, I think, thinking broadly that bacteria are the fundamental causative factor in species. And um, we started thinking about the gut microbiome as being a very general uh, uh, microbial community for animals. And that these may be um, thought of as entities as part of the whole genome that perhaps are involved in speciation. The Sonia system comes up again. So here's why. So if we look at um, sort of where the general microbial community is in the Sonia, it's in the hindgut. And what's staying here are the gamma proteobacteria. And the gamma proteobacteria are very common in insects. So most of our model systems have a lot of gamma proteobacteria in their guts. And these are different than what occurs in mammalian guts. So mice and humans have Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes, different phyla, very different phyla of bacteria. So at this broad level, mammals have different microbes than insects do. There's a little bit of species specificity here, if you will, in small sample size. But we started thinking about you know, what happens within the diverse, within Nisonia, the species diversity, not the phylum diversity, but the species diversity. So these are the three species of Nisonia. They're reared on the same diets. We start to measure bacterial diversity through 16S sequencing. And this is the larval stage, a very simple community, uh, dominated by one particular bacteria in this case. The pupae has an enriched uh, level of microbial diversity. The adults have an even richer microbial diversity. So effectively, we have this blossoming, if you will, of microbial diversity over development through metamorphosis. And this is not unlike humans, where bacterial diversity increases from age zero to two pretty dramatically in, in human development. So I think this will be a common phenomenon um, in animals in general, just at different scales and time points. For reference, uh, this is the host microbial community. So just thinking about the role of diet in acquiring microbes. Okay, so I want to get back to comparing trees, right? So this is the Nasonia phylogeny, again. And we wanted to ask, does the microbial community parallel the evolution of the Nisonia phylogeny? They're all on the same diet. So null hypothesis, they have the same bacteria. But in fact, um, we see that both in the pupil stage and the adult stage, this unifrac tree separates out these developmental communities because they are different. But then within each developmental community, Geralti and Longicornis, just like the nuclear phylogeny, are more closely related to each other than they are to vitropenis. We see the same thing in the adult community. So this is highly statistically significant. We wouldn't expect this by randomness. And this suggests that just as if there's an evolutionary signal here in the genes, there could be an ancestral signal in the microbial communities that have changed in these species backgrounds. So I like to think of this as not a phylogeny, but phylosymbiosis, where it's the microbial community that has a signal of the ancestry of the host organism when the diet's controlled for, when the environment's controlled. Okay, so phylosymbiosis is present in Nisonia. What happens when we make hybrids? Okay, so the idea here is that perhaps we have two good species, A and B, and they're in a balance between their immune system and their microbiome. There's some homeostasis maintained within these species. Now, if we make hybrids and the hybrids happen to be sick, one reason may be because there's an imbalance in their microbiome relative to their immune system. So in this case, we have extreme pathogenesis taking over in hybrids, where the immune response isn't quite competent enough to keep up with the pathogens that these hybrids have to handle. Another case is where the immune response is so strong, a hyperimmune response, almost like an autoimmune response, um, causes dysbiosis where good bacteria can't even get in to sort of be sufficient and, and provide a healthy microbiome for the individual. Why might this be going on? Well, if you look at the Bates and Dubzhansky and Muller model, and you start to think about how do new uh, hybrid incompatibilities evolve, um, I want to show you something about when we add symbionts. So this is just a two locus Bates and Dubzhansky Muller model, ancestral population splits, big A splits here, big B splits here, and then we make F1 hybrids with one potential hybrid incompatibility shown in the red arrows, where A and B negatively, uh, uh, negatively interact to cause hybrid incompatibilities. Right? Standard model, two, three locus model, we get three incompatibilities. But if we do 
a two locus model, a nuclear locus model, plus one symbiont to replace the third locus, we get six potential hybrid incompatibilities. So in this case, symbiosis has simply doubled the possible number of hybrid incompatibilities that could evolve over di these divergence events. And therefore, we might expect feedback between the genome and the microbiome that breaks down in hybrids and essentially assists hybrid mortality or sterility. You see hybrid mortality in the Sonia hybrids, and it's in the F2 generation. So these are just cracked open flyers of the Sonia vitropenis and the Sonia geralti. The yellow things are pupae, um, and there are lots of yellow pupae and little hosts left behind. In their F2 hybrids, you see a lot of death. There's about 80 to 90 percent mortality. The fly carcass is left behind. Um, and we have calculated sort of the level of hybrid mortality. So these are just the parental controls. And then this is the hybrid mortality over developmental time. And most of the mortality, in fact, about 78% of it, occurs between the L1 and L4 stage. Check out this guy. So this is a dead hybrid between Geralti and Vitropenos. This is a living hybrid between or from one of the parental species. There's a melanization response here, which is sometimes indicative of an inflammation response. And that, coupled with phytosymbiosis in the Sonia, made us think that perhaps there's a breakdown in the microbial community that's causing the hybrid death. So um, again, we've taken uh, these species of Nasonia, we hybridize them, we make these F2 recombinants. You should note that these are haploid, and because it's the haploid diploid organism, the males are haploid. So we have recombinants that are haploid that express all potential recessive incompatibility factors that underlie potentially this hybrid death. And if we move forward to the microbiome of these hybrids, the older species pair um, shows a microbiome like this. So in red is Providencia, and blue is Proteus, and green is everything else. These are gamma proteobacteria, and the hybrids that die. Now we're measuring these microbiomes in the L1 stage, just before hybrid mortality. The microbiome is unlike that of the parents. So we've had a complete abundance switch from Providencia to Proteus. And this associates with hybrid mortality. In the younger species pair, we actually see different microbial communities between Longicornis and Geraltin. And ultimately, the F2 hybrid in which we don't see mortality, because this is the younger species pair, looks a lot like one of their parental species. So this was correlative data that said, okay, if you die, you have a different microbiome just before death. And if you don't die, you look like one of your parents. So this kept us moving forward on thinking about the microbiome being perhaps causal in the speciation or the hybrid mortality here. Um, if you were to put the microbial diversity on a tree, this is another one of those unifrac trees. Um, note that Longicornis and Geralti still show phylosymbiosis. They're more closely related than they are to Vitropenis. The Longicornis Geralti hybrid from the younger species pair is lives. The Vitropenis Geralti hybrid dies. And what's happening here is it looks like there's a decoupling of the microbiome from the genetic background. Because this microbial community for this particular background isn't normal too far away from the Geralta and the Trapanus microbiomes in the parents. Whereas the LG hybrid has a microbiome that looks a lot like LL. Again, it's all associative to the causal experiment. And the hypothesis here is that gut bacteria enhance hybrid mortality. So as I've shown, obviously non-hybrids don't die. Conventionally hybrids do die. The germ-free hybrid, to start to get a causation, if the microbiome is causal in mortality, should live. It should look just like a regular conventional non-hybrid. And then we could put bacteria back into the germ-free hybrids and hopefully reinstate hybrid mortality. So that would be the set of experiments we'd want to do. Now, Nasonia are parasitoid wasps, so they chew on flies. And we had to develop a way to make them germ-free. This is not trivial. So my student went at it and uh, he developed uh, basically this transwell assay where the, lar the eggs are put on a basket that forms a meniscus layer just underneath the uh, eggs. And that meniscus layer is made up of fly hemolymph and antibiotics to create a sterile environment. 
And you can get the eggs from Nisonia to, to develop into pupae and sometimes adulthood this way. And this provided us the perfect window because mortality occurs in the larval state. So we can score larval mortality easily with this transwell assay. Okay, so I'm just showing you sort of eggs, larvae, pupae here. We do the conventional hybridization, uh, significant mortality in the hybrids. We do the germ-free experiment, significant, actually no significant differences between the parentals, and obviously a remarkable increase in survival without microbes of the hybrid genotypes that should be dying. They should be dying, but without the microbes, they don't. And then we put bacteria back into the hybrids, and we can reinstate some of the mortality. We just took a few OTUs that are culturable from the Sony and put them back in. So this looks like the gut bacteria are one of the conditions by which hybrids um, are dying. And without the bacteria, hybrids live. Um, this doesn't mean that genetics is not involved. It just means that there is a component of the microbiome that's required for hybrid mortality. So in the whole genome, we'd expect some kind of interaction between the genetics of the nucleus and the genetics of the microbial community. And it turns out 10 years prior to this work, there had been a lot of effort in the Nasonia community mapping QTLs for hybrid mortality to the five Nasonia chromosomes. And I've just shown the QTL peaks with a little larvae on, on the chromosomes. And all these dashes are just molecular markers. Okay. Uh, we expect from this kind of simple modeling that these loci perhaps may actually be interacting with the microbiome to enhance, if not cause, mortality. So what do these loci look like? Um, and do they interact with the microbiome? That is uh, an ongoing goal. But I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done so far. So we've created a, a way to annotate Nasonia's immune genes. We have full genome sequences from all three Nasonia species. We took model systems and created a database that allowed us to annotate Nasonia's um, immune system. For those of you that are interested in insect immunity, this database is open and live. And Nasonia, through our annotation, has uh, the highest gene set for immune genes so far. We think that's just because of the comprehensive analysis we did. And then we use that immune gene set to do transcriptome analysis to ask, how are the immune genes being expressed in hybrids relative to um, hybrids that live. So let me go through this. This is obviously a germ-free hybrid that lives. These are the 500 or so immune genes that are expressed. This is an inoculated hybrid and a conventional hybrid, both of which die. And the, obviously the eye is drawn to the fact that the immune genes in the germ-free hybrid are hypo-expressed relative to the dead hybrids. About 40% of the genes are misexpressed at a two-fold level, either up or down relative to the um, dead hybrids. So it looks like there's a lot of immune problems which would make sense because the microbial community is also going high. And we reason that in future work, ultimately we can take candidates that are misexpressed in the germ-free versus dead hybrids and map them back to the QTL regions as candidate genes for the QTLs that may interact with the microbiome in an epistatic way to essentially cause mortality. If we remove the microbiome, like we've done, we remove mortality. We also think that if we remove the QTLs, the whole genome would predict that we'd also be able to remove mortality that way. So it takes two to tango to get reproductive isolation here. And that, I think, is where you know a lot of the biology in Sonia is saying the whole genome looks pretty darn evident in that kind of a model. OK, uh, to reinforce some of, of this idea. Um, we've been able to take molecular markers that associate with hybrid mortality and show that they actually change to Mendelian ratios in germ-free viable hybrids. So here are three chromosomes and a particular marker that associates with hybrid mortality. Um, in the conventional hybridization, the expectation is that these are the frequencies of a vitropanosyl allele. Um, this just means that 75% of the offspring inherit the vitropenis allele, 25% inherit Geralta. So there's a ratio distortion in this marker frequency, evident of non mendelian ratios in hybrid mortality. And then we observed in a new experiment basically the same frequencies. This is kind of a control here. Um, and then basically in the germ-free hybrids that survive, those marker ratio distortions go back to Mendelian ratios. So we rescue viability, we rescue the marker ratio distortions. 
Uh, let me summarize a little bit, start to wrap up. So in our work, uh, at least in Nisonia, the whole genome looks like it has both a phylogenetic and a phylosymbiotic basis, as evident through these two, um, two sets of trees that we've looked at. And we plan to do this uh, much more extensively in the future. Hybridization between the old species pair, where we only see mortality, uh, results in this sort of uh, dysbiosis where the hybrids don't have a microbial community like that of their parents. And finally, the lethality appears to have a whole genomic basis, which requires both the genome and the microbiome to get full depth. Okay, so how common is this? Is this just a Nisonia thing and nobody cares about it because it's just Nisonia? Or might it be more common? So we've been thinking about, you know, how this is evident in the literature that precedes this work. And the Rosenbergs, I mentioned, published some work on the whole genome. So they took Drosophila melanogaster, one strain, separated it out onto maltose and I forget the other media, sugar media or something, and reared the flies. And within one generation, plus more sometimes, they brought them back together and they got significant mate discrimination. And one line of Drosophila melanogaster, different diets. What changed? Well, the genetics didn't change, right? It's the microbiome that changed on the different diets. And that microbiome, in turn, has changed the secondary compounds in the flies to affect potentially their ability to mate with each other. Well, not potentially, they did. All right. Secondly, um, there are many cases of ecological speciation facilitated by a very well-known endosomont. So these are aphids. Aphids feed on plant sap, which is a nutrient deficient diet. Uh, they harbor Buchnera symbionts that provide the essential uh, nutrients that the diet lacks. And there are 4,000 species of aphids on the planet, none of which would exist without Buchnera symbionts being aphids. And there are many other cases where we know nutritional symbionts have essentially led to these radiations. So we need to think about these as cases of speciation by symbiosis. Um, as some of you know already, Kirsten Bombley's work in Arabidopsis, she took uh, simply populations of Arabidopsis and hybridized them. And at some very small frequency, interpopulation hybrids led to these kinds of phenotypes. So these are the parentals, these are the hybrids. And she mapped the genetics of these early nascent kind of hybrid compatibilities within Arabidopsis to immune loci. And I will contend, uh, contrary to the quote I put up in the beginning of the seminar, is that when you map reproductive isolation of chromosomes, and if they map to immune genes, then symbiosis is very likely to be in play because immune genes won't be interacting on their own. They're likely interacting with the microbiome that interacts with internally. So just because mapping, we map to chromosomes, doesn't mean that symbiosis is not in play. And it, you know, the, there are still many challenges for thinking about the whole genome as a real entity. I'm skeptical of it myself. Um, I think we have prevailing camps, uh, those of us that work in the microbiome are actively thinking about the whole genome. I think those of us in evolutionary genetics think about symbiosis, but the large majority of the community doesn't think about probably the whole genome. And there's got to be some way we can start to fuse these two ideas together in a more holistic way um, and hopefully prevent those quotes from 2013 showing up. Uh, we want to look at phylosymbiosis and see how much more common it is outside of Nisonia. So these are some taxa that we're going to interrogate. They have well-structured uh, host systems. We're doing invertebrates to vertebrates. And we're even going to take the risk of going to humans and basically ask, does ancestry predict the microbiome relationships? Now, the key is we're going to do this all on controlled diets, controlled um, diets and environments as much as possible. So these are all organisms that we can breed in the lab and do this with. With humans, we're going to take them to a nutrition clinic and basically give them the same diet and then look for ancestral signals in the microbiome when they're on the same diet. So this is a lot of work on human microbiome, and it's all confounded. They have very big differences in diet and phylogeny, and they find effects of both, but it's so confounding you don't know how to interpret it. So what we want to know is perhaps at even these small scales of divergence, and I actually don't think we're going to get a signature in the microbiome, but it's worth testing because they're humans. So. An age will fund that, maybe. All right. So we're, um, I want to sort of thank, thank the NSF to mention the biodiversity program. This is a gratuitously cute picture of Robert Brucker with a basset hound puppy right there. <laughs> and he's, again, done all the work and um, I think has a, a good future ahead of him.
some technicians and rotation students and some undergraduates who have helped out in this work. And uh, Rob is an artist, so I will end with this slide. And he likes to do these cool things about symbiosis and speciation. So he made this agar plate, right, with bacteria kind of growing out from this tree um, so that we can look at phylogenies through perhaps the lens of the microbiome, at least in some systems. So I'll thank you for listening and be happy to take any questions if you guys have any. I hope I didn't steamroll over on Yeah, well. Do you think we'll ever find examples of the species from symbiosis and vertebrates and dignity even in the work stream? <laughs> you know, I, the latter question might be interesting from a, a, a pheromone perspective, right? So there could be mate attraction things going on because different microbes actually give us our pheromones that mix in with the skin of our, the sweat of our skin. And it could be that mate attraction is affected by that. Clearly, it isn't resolvable in the second generation. Mosquitoes can hone in on humans because they have a certain microbial region that smells good. So you know, if you have the right microbes get attacked and what can be attacked in those things. Arguably there could be senses that we don't measure or think about, but these microbes are affecting attraction. Um, so in terms of vertebrates, yeah, I, I do I do think there are immense possibility. I mean, particularly if we go into these deer mice and we find phylosymbiosis, they're also hybridizable species and so we will look at both phylosymbiosis and potentially reproductive isolation traits and all so I think, you know, it's early days and, you know, we don't have a lot of evidence, but the data is saying, take a look. You know, let's just see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My, it's a bunch of fun question. Um, could you say a few words about the diet of the Sonia? Is it any different? It's actually a big thing on and it's like a bio might actually push through. Sonia, the diarrhea microbes may actually come out smaller, less happy than those that are not getting pushed in. Yeah, so I did say that. Um, let me take that last part. The microbe free Nasonia go to pupation easily. It's harder to get them to go to adulthood. So you get a small fraction surviving to adulthood. So there's clearly you know, mortality happening through that metamorphosis stage. In terms of the flies um, being sort of nutritionally calm competent. Um, you know, they sting these things out in the wild. They sting flesh flies. They also sting blow flies, which occur in birds' nests. So um, I think we've matched that ecological condition in the lab. Um, but clearly there's something, you know, essential in the microbiome to get everybody through adulthood. Now it may just be that we need to tweak the media a little bit to get to that point. So I'm not, you know, I think we actually could create germ-free animals that go to adulthood, just maybe that we don't have the right thing in there yet. Observe this uh, dominance in the, the pupae that die from hibernating belly. The larvae, yeah. The larvae, sorry. Yeah. Uh, where, uh, where one microbe seems to dominate, and that's sort of the signature for the death of these things. Is that microbe basically uh, taking advantage of the death of the host and just, just growing like crazy, or is it actually driving the death and is it competing with the uh, or is it sort of unfettered in its competition and it just kills off the rest of the Well, that, I mean, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the removal of the microbiome from the hybrids completely rescues mortality. So in that sense, it is causal. Sure, right. but is it that one that, that is that, that dominant microbe that's driving the yeah. mortality? So we've inoculated with that one and so Providence and Proteus are the two cultural ones. We've inoculated with both and can get mortality with both. Um, now, they're both gamma proteobacteria and they're both uh, specific to Nusonia. So at that level, that's our knowledge. Uh, we don't know much further than that. If sort of the farther we go out, symbionts, do we not get more down? I don't know. So the idea is that those immune functions that are distinct between perhaps between those, those groups allow, in the hybrid, it allows 
one of those groups to just to just not. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's obviously a couple breakdown in the immune system and the microbiome. It's a little difficult to say which one comes first, but they're both happening, and if we take one out, we rest it. But I'm not, I don't know if the microbiome goes awry and that causes misexpression in the system, or if the immune expression goes awry and then the microbes um, take advantage of that. Yeah. Am I looking at gene expression like the gene that's more in They're all hybrids. Would you look at gene expression in the microbiome? Do you expect the germ? We have when you compare normal, yeah. like non um, right. animal, it's not because it's not Right. Yeah, so we have not done, uh, because of cost, uh, immune expression in non hybrids. Right. But we do know that non hybrid Asonia that are germ free live pretty good. So they, they make it to you know, 80% survival of wild type. So at least they're getting through. Um, but we don't know the, if the gene expression signature has changed. Do you think that's relevant to interpreting any of the data? Well, like, I don't know anything about this very much about the but my first thought is that if you have a germ in the animal, then the gene expression of the gene is not going to be in the animal. Sure. So having a higher expression of these animals in the dying doesn't mean that the expression I agree with you. I agree. With you. I think it just presents the obvious candidate functional set to go after, and then if it kind of maps for the QTLs, we'll target those first, particularly ones that cause melanization. Right. right. That so would be an obvious. Yeah. It might whittle down the candidates. Yeah. That's right. Thanks. Understand the ontogenetic shift in the microbiome So yeah. So why is there such a big difference? And I'm wondering if cloning communities come in and they are some of our genetic variants are kind of passing into storage or what? Yeah. So we get this question a lot, and you know we have to answer it with I don't know, except I think that there's probably a small. Uh, there's a low abundant class of microbial diversity that wasn't detected in the sequencing, and that that's always there. So that provides the raw material for successions to occur over metamorphosis. Uh, when the larvae go into pupation, they essentially empty their guts to pupate. So there's there, there's going to be a dramatic succession in microbes when they empty out their guts, and then what comes into the pupae and do could potentially be very different because of the emptied space, essentially. Um, so that might be one thing that's going on there, and then um, that enrichment just kind of gets a little further in the adults, maybe because they're breathing, maybe because they've shed their puparium covering. Um, so, yes, that's kind of where we are with that knowledge. My guess is the mother is perhaps pooping some of it out and seeding it into the environment that these larvae are feeding on. Another guess would be that everything is everywhere. All microbes are everywhere, and it's just... The animals are selecting through their immune system what microbes to acquire specifically for that developmental state. <laughs> to be continued. We don't know the answer to that. Sorry. That's a question. Yes. Yeah. You have twos? In the F2s. Yeah. I think you said F1s, but F2s, yeah. yeah. So, do methods survive that make a difference? Good question. We don't know that. We haven't sampled it. And the part we haven't sampled it because there, there's 90% dead, 10% alive. Um, so, we just have to scale the experiment up so that we get enough from the dead. But that would be interesting. I see where you're going with that. You expect the microbial community not to be aberrant, just living. Thanks. Okay, thanks.